A leagues, with its brutalist style, has really carved a niche for itself that's unlike anything else on the market today. Their focus on craftsmanship, quality, and a consistent aesthetic with great promotion affords them a consumer demand that will undoubtedly last many years. I think Alix is likely our generation's best bet at a long-lasting contribution to fashion, but why? 1017 Alix 9SM was founded in 2015 as simply Alix by Matthew Williams, his wife at the time Jennifer Murray, and Luca Benini, who was financing the venture. However, it seems like a lot of Alix is made up of the understanding of the market that he developed in his earlier label, Bean Trill, which he led along with Virgil Abloh, Heron Preston, Justin Saunders, and a man who was later revealed to be Yi. Bean Trill was a label synonymous with PR and hype that rose to prominence in the late 2000s, early 2010s, and was really popular in the music and streetwear scenes in America, even becoming one of the first streetwear brands adopted by many of the big name luxury department stores. But Mostly because it was hype-based, its popularity fizzled out by around 2013-ish. Bean Trill was then sold to PacSun in 2015, and although the amount nor the exact date of the sale has been released that I could find, it seems that because of the timing that it may have been this that funded the initial Autumn Winter 15 collection of Alix, as well as the aforementioned financial backing from Slam Jam socialism founder Luca Bonini. The Alix debut was Autumn Winter 15, and it was really very commercial. It promoted itself as luxury streetwear, which was novel at the time with their now trademark monochromatic palette. And although these pictures are beautiful and the clothing is nice, there's no major visual differentiator in the product. Though in fairness, they do have the roller coaster buckle included in the collection, even if it is hard to see in these images. But interestingly, the buckle actually wasn't successful at launch and wouldn't be a signature for a year and a half. So even though it was present, it wasn't as impactful as it is now. In fact, the clothing in the collection as a whole simply isn't creatively interesting at all. He stated in this interview, as he did with many, many other interviews, that he wanted his brand to be about evolution, not revolution. And I think that's very clear from even this early stage. Because honestly, the differentiator for Alix would not be noticeable from these images alone, but instead, was born of the clearly high marketing budget, industry connections, and reputation from Bean Trill that afforded him to do the business side of the company differently. However, despite him having really great connections following the founding, which was in July, there actually wasn't much buzz around the brand that I could find until they had these two videos produced by world famous photographer Nick Knight. These were promoted on Show Studio on the 1st of September later that year, along with a launch party and PR articles on sites like Vogue's on the same day. All of this really blew up the buzz around the brand coming into their Spring Summer 16 collection that debuted only 10 days later. It really was fantastic promotion for the company in a way that was similar, though markedly different, to the promotion of Bean Trill, which also used multi-channel marketing as a tactic which is where brands will host or post the same or similar content over multiple channels to widen the reach of their promotional material. Just to dig into this a little deeper, and although I couldn't technically find confirmation, I think the PR was done by this man, Pierre Rougier. He was present at the launch party, they still have a working relationship today, and he has connections to have made this collection as well received as it was. But also, he is famously protective over his client's public image, which is important to note because Yi, who is doing a lot of the PR for Bean Trill, is famously not. Because of this launch, the Spring Summer 16 collection was really the first to get the name of the brand out there to the wider fashion interested audience, and it's here that we see the expansion of promotion of Alix as one of their main company differentiators. The PR team had really successfully done their job with the launch of the company by effectively creating a narrative for the company as THE luxury sportswear brand that had an emphasis on reliability and construction. This plan for their brand positioning was exceptionally successful and saw that within days of their launch party that they had many reputable stockists including Dover Street Market New York, New York's Mariam Nazir Zader, London's Machine A and Miami's Alchemist that meant they were stocked globally within just 10 days of their official launch party. If I am correct about Rougier at PR Consulting doing the promotion, which admittedly I might not be, fashion is very tight-lipped about these things and he did not email me back. I think he set the company up in a way that was extremely beneficial for the longevity of the company. 
Keeping them out of drama, but in the mouths of fashionable people, proved to be extremely smart planning for the company in the long run. But really, it wouldn't have been possible if the collections weren't as very commercially viable as they were. In fact, Elites would continue to be very commercially focused with inoffensive, pretty standard designs in mostly monochromatic colors for every season from here forward with almost the same identifiers in each collection, namely monochrome, mesh, and the roller coaster buckle. They offered easy to integrate items to consumers' wardrobes with an in the know buckle that provided enough added perceived value to make it desirable. This is really so genius from a marketing standpoint. Inherently, there is very little that is new about a piece of clothing from Elite's. Of course, they have the odd piece, even from the early collections, like the silver trousers from Spring Summer 16, and they do tend to have one or two colors in each collection to make it pop. But creative clothing is simply not what they're trying to sell to their consumer. They're selling the image and status that comes with knowing the brand, which of course is something to be expected, as that is nearly always how a streetwear brand approaches marketing. It sounds like this is a criticism, but it is genuinely not. It is the way that modern fashion is evolving and branding currently is the largest perceived value creator. But for Elite's, this wouldn't be enough. They really backed this positioning up by focusing very, very much on solidly made garments that would genuinely last a long time. Hence this added focus on the safety buckle, which is a great materialization of the brand's point of view, evidenced by the fact that the buckle is actually made by an Austrian car engine manufacturer, so it's really genuinely built to last, as is their timeless monochromatic color palette and also timeless fabric choices done with an extreme focus on quality. Effectively, they forged a new positioning between big name luxury and luxury streetwear that could sit on the shelves alongside niche luxury labels and probably outperform them in terms of quality too. But given how construction focused the products were and business focused the company was, along with having such a brutalist aesthetic, this was perhaps a point of weakness for the company as it may have come across a little too cold or inhuman which is why it seems to me that they decided to add a humanizing element in the name of the company itself, having named the company after his daughter Alix to add a warmth and humanness to the company's image, they later added 1017, which is Matthew Williams's birthday, and 9SM for 9 St. Mark's, the address of his first studio. This unique brand positioning and ability to make brutalism humanized is what I believe got them shortlisted for the 2016 LVMH prize for young fashion designers. And although they didn't win, it's a true testament to how successful this brand positioning and brand image was that it got them to being one of the most talked about niche designers of 2016 going into 2017, when Elite would then double down on this perceived focus on construction and also sustainability. Though this isn't a really massively well-marketed facet of the company at this point, over the years of Elite's, Matthew Williams has been developing his supply chain to be as eco-friendly as possible with recycled materials like his nylon or his waterless dyeing process of leather. But when he began realizing that being in New York that he had less awareness of what was happening in his manufacturing factories, he knew that he needed to move to guarantee that his product could be made to his exact specifications and quality that people had come to expect from Elite's, which of course is much harder to guarantee from the other side of the world. Williams moved his entire family from New York to Italy just before his Spring Summer 18 show to focus on being near to the Elite's factories, which, much like most of his work so far, though it doesn't add any visual difference to the product, he's going for evolution, not revolution, and is using this to focus on making genuinely the best quality product that has the least environmental impact widening his differentiators to his competitors that often weren't looking at this aspect of their business or didn't have the means to improve on that. This personal ethos he took forward to his collaborations as well, with Nike in June 2018 adopting the leather dyeing practice for his collab, and to Macintosh in Spring Summer 18 who already made clothing genuinely made to last a lifetime. In fact, with this knowledge that the company has focused so heavily on quality product over hype, Elite has crafted a narrative that they are our generation's go-to for clothing that is both desirable, timeless, and will truly last a lifetime. This mirrors the early days of many of the big name designer brands that too started by making the best of their speciality and became known for that without the pressure of the current fashion system that is largely based on self-cannibalizing. 
He talks about it in this interview in more depth, though he also emphasizes that for him to be able to get to the level where his company is able to defy the industry standard of seasonal timeframes that encourage self-cannibalism, he needed to grow his business. This he would do through his connections. Namely with Kim Jones, who through introducing Aleeks in his debut Dior Spring Summer 19 show, could offer his company exposure to a wider audience that potentially could help Aleeks achieve their goal of scaling. And though Kim Jones' debut at Dior was released to mixed reviews, as I said in my recent Dior video, the real star of the show were the collaborators, which of course makes sense as Kim Jones is really known for his collaborations. The Elite's roller coaster buckle, some plain, some given a slight redesign to include the Christian Dior acronym CD, was heavily used throughout the collection on most of the accessories in the show, and so it was a huge breakthrough for the brand. Having Dior replicate almost exactly Alix's work not only validated Alix as a luxury purchase, but brought so much more attention to the label and the extreme level of quality on which he's grown the company, which along with the Nike collab was also a huge success for Alix's popularity and saw their brand equity increase greatly. So Dior used the Alix roller coaster buckle in their collection on accessories. But it's also important to note that prior to this, the Alix biannual collections had also been developing slowly on their own accessories and had recently added bags to their product offering, which actually didn't sell well in the beginning, as he mentioned in this interview. They began both with leather and fabric bags in Spring 17, but then hugely pulled back the bags to only one in Autumn Winter 17, which was their debut of the harness bag, before their move to Italy, which saw their bags make a huge jump in quality for their Spring 18, in which they debuted their now hugely popular crossbody bag that became a real staple of the company following the Dior collection that directly affected awareness of the Alix bags in a positive way. In this time, Alix saw revenue double year on year until 2019 when they were making tens of millions in turnover and truly everything with the company was on the up and up coming into the spring summer 2020 collection when they would innovate once again in their supply chain. For nine items in the collection, Alix would launch a blockchain system in which each part of the manufacturing process would be documented and made available to the customer on purchase. The supply chain is extremely complicated, but this simplified diagram from Vogue allows us to see what kinds of stages a leak registers to the QR code that we can see. I went to Google to find a code to scan to see how in-depth this is for myself, and though it took a really long time to load, it was then unable to tell me that this picture was inauthentic. I don't know whether that's because it timed out or whether the code was actually inauthentic, I really don't know. So I went to a store that carried a leak to check it out for myself, and actually I couldn't find any single product with the tag. So I assume it really is still very limited, but it's certainly a step in the right direction into having transparency in fashion, which has been a talking point for many years across the market. Therefore, potentially, this puts the brand in the right light if from what I've seen on Google Images is included, which is, I think, all the steps in the supply chain, the country in which it was manufactured, and then more details about each step as well. Obviously, this makes a leaks look really good if it does go onto more products, but blockchain is famously hard to integrate for fashion because components to a product can come from so many places. So it's really no wonder that they only launched blockchain for nine products, especially considering he doesn't own his own factories. Though they did say back in 2019 when this debuted that they were looking for expansion on this idea, I just haven't been able to find information on how that has scaled unfortunately though i obviously do hope it has and actually if anyone has a product with a qr code that i could scan available i would love to see what it looks like honestly or maybe alix would be kind enough to send me a qr code and i can make a short about what it actually looks like to show you guys interestingly though this is yet another way that alix has added value to their products without the need of actually changing the product much at all they have, unlike countless other brands, decided to innovate constructionally and technologically instead of, this is a bit of a harsh word, but creatively. Really, you could definitely argue that innovating in this way requires creativity in the business sense. It's just that the product itself has slowly and minimally changed throughout the years. 
This, of course, is not to say that the Alix products aren't visually appealing. Quite the contrary, he's one of the leaders in bringing techwear to popularity, and he wouldn't have been hired as the creative director of Givenchy if he wasn't a genuinely talented designer. But because they have been looking towards evolution and not revolution, it meant that the innovations and revolutions came from the business side of the company, the technological side of the business, the constructional side of the business. I really appreciate this change of perspective on luxury that changes the focus to the function of the product, not the form. But yet, it doesn't ignore the form either. Which brings us to the Automotive 23 show that just showed a few hours ago. Throughout this video, I explained how Alix has been growing to create a very solid base for themselves with quality products and reliable clothes. Autumn Winter 23 has been so exciting, specifically because it did not do everything that we were expecting. They announced yesterday that they were collaborating with Mark Flood, who's an American interdisciplinary artist known for his dystopian punk-informed sensibility, and I knew from that point that this Alix show was going to be unlike anything we've seen before. The collection was easily the most experimental, exciting show we've seen from the brand so far. Not only because they developed so much on the design that we would usually expect, almost being completely something new, but because they've done it in a timely manner. They have a foundation to build on and they're now able to experiment with that foundation in a way that's exciting to see. Because of this, I was a little hesitant, a little curious to know how much of this collection we are going to see in stores, but they've grown such an incredible fan base that I don't doubt that this will sell out completely. I think this will be one of their collector's collections in years to come, their riot 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 if you will. The clothing itself was more sporty than we've seen from the brand before. It was also a little bit more colourful and more graphic, especially with the text, which I'm pretty sure comes from the artist. We also got less black and less of the roller coaster buckle in this collection. I actually really enjoyed it because it did push our idea of what Alix is, and it left me so excited for what they're going to develop on in the future. Alix has taken the time to genuinely develop a brand, aesthetic, and extremely high quality garments, and a fan base that is dedicated to the vision. I genuinely believe Alix is our generation's contribution to big name luxury. Their evolution parallels so many of the big luxury houses that started slow, focused on construction, and developed a customer base from there to whom they could experiment with. Alix's unique approach to the industry comes at a time when construction is unreliable in the current luxury market because of the focus on aesthetic over functionality, which really, it should be both if we're being honest. Yet Alix's unwillingness to make a lesser product has already developed a following that will be in Alix for many years to come. I hope that they continue on this trajectory of desirable, true quality luxury for many years to come, and we see in our lifetime Alix grow to that level. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. Check out Underskin, my beauty channel for this, but about cosmetics. And if you can and would like to support further, I'll have my Patreon link below.